Alright, so in this video, I would be talking about the peptide bond. And by definition, the peptide bond is that which connects two amino acids in order to form a longer peptide chain. So, when I talk about a peptide, alright, it's a chain of many amino acids that have already been bonded together using the peptide bond. So, um, polypeptides are usually um, around less than 100 amino acids and uh, some references say that when you get beyond 100 amino acids that's when you call the peptide chain a protein but whether it's named as protein or polypeptide the thing is it all starts out with a peptide bond so how do I demonstrate that I'm going to show it using the simplest possible peptide which is of course a dipeptide consisting of only two amino acids so this is amino acid 1 and amino acid 2 and, I, and for clarity I've um, expanded the structure of the carboxyl group on the first and the amino group on the second because this would be uh, easier for me, this would make it this this would make it easier for me to demonstrate how the peptide bond is formed of course it's a chemical reaction and what happens is that um, nitrogen here would attempt to bond to the carbon here in the carboxyl group and uh, if you remember in organic chemistry the carboxyl group can actually have the OH as a leaving group all right so this one could actually leave this bond could be broken in exchange for the bond of the carbon with the nitrogen but the nitrogen here would now have how many bonds one two three four bonds so um, it would be actually easy for nitrogen to give out one hydrogen in order to maintain its uh, trivalency because nitrogen is supposed to have only three bonds so we remove this OH we remove this H so they become a byproduct which is water and as a result what happens is well, I'm just going to draw the rest of uh, the structure here because it doesn't change oh sorry this is in color red color red H R and again we have here H and then the OH this is the byproduct which is water and uh, again the nitrogen and the carbon make a bond and this blue bond is the peptide bond or some uh, people would I don't know what references use this they call the peptide bond the omega bond and so in that way we have already formed a dipeptide other things to note there's an actual name of this process so a formation of a carbon uh, bond to other atoms such as nitrogen all right in exchange for removal of water is a reaction known as condensation so the peptide bond formation is actually a condensation reaction Alright, which exchanges water for a formation of a new bond of this carbon to form the dipeptide. One thing I would like to no note also is that remember that when we draw amino acids or when we talk about amino acids in humans, they are always of the L configuration. And um, this means that if I have a dipeptide here, this first amino acid will always have a free amino group at the end. All right, a free amino group at the end and this one at the right will have a free carboxyl group what what does that mean the carboxyl group of the first amino acid has already bonded to form the peptide bond and here the amino group of the second has done the same one consequence of this is that these two cannot anymore give out charges all right they are not anymore titratable meaning no matter how you adjust the pH of the environment anything which any of the functional groups which have involved which were involved in formation of a peptide bond will not anymore 
uh, be capable of inducing a charge. The only ones that are titratable in this will be this one and this one, the free amino and carboxyl groups at the terminals. Alright? These are the only ones which are titratable. And if the R group, alright, is um, any of the seven which I will specify later on, this can also be a titratable group. But this one, not anymore. Alright, another thing I would like to note is that since this is going to be the structure, for example, I have 10 amino acids here. All of their um, carboxyls and aminos in the middle cannot anymore be titratable, so we don't really care about that anymore. But there will always be an amino group that is free at the leftmost part. So this is why uh, we have a name for this terminal or end and that is actually the end terminal because there's an amino group there, a nitrogen there, which can have a charge. And this one, we have the carboxyl group, which is free at the rightmost part. That's why at the rightmost part, we call this the C terminal or terminus, whatever. Alright. Then another thing is that other than the peptide bonds, the other bonds here actually have names. So the bond between the carbon and the amino group is known as the phi bond phi all right still this is the symbol for that and then the bond between the carbon and the carbox carbonyl carbon now here is the psi this is the symbol for psi so we have phi we have psi we have omega so that's it about peptide bonds and we'll actually now combine the concept of peptide bonds and titratable groups because I've just mentioned which groups are titratable and which groups are not and I said that in this case there are only seven R groups which can be titratable well I would like to clue you in that five of those seven are already probably quite obvious why because these are the seven ones all right these are the five which are obvious. Why? Because these are the, acid, the amino acids with actual R groups which can have charges. Remember, we have aspartic acid, we have glutamic acid which have R groups that when charged against its acidic R, negative. Here we have histidine, lysine, and arginine. If their R groups become charged, their charge is positive that's why they're basic in the first place so meaning the r groups of these ones are titratable all right and uh, this means that the r groups of again of um this seven including this one are also titratable and also titratable and also another thing i forgot is that there's a term for the r group which uh, is part of the peptide but not anymore as a free amino acid the name of these R groups in peptides are residues so for example in a dipeptide I would say that in a dipeptide I have one peptide bond which is quite obvious one peptide bond two amino acid but not amino acids or red uh, per se because Remember, we already removed this part of the amino acid, so we say amino acid residues, particularly the as the R groups of those two amino acids. All right. So we could actually have also a formula here: the number of peptide bonds or omega bonds is equal to the number of amino acid residues in the peptide minus one. All right. I think that's a that's easy to derive or ponder upon. All right. And the other two titratable groups come from our polar amino acids which is which are cysteine and tyrosine. Meaning that again I've said that titratable groups should have a pKa in order to determine whether at a particular pH they would have a charge or not. So meaning out of the 20 amino acids the only amino acids whose R groups can have a pKa are these 7. D E H K R C Y. So what does that mean? Let's try to apply what I have just mentioned here in the peptide formation and the titratable groups. I have here this peptide crying. Okay, so first things first. Out of this, 
it is obvious that there would always be two titratable groups automatic in every peptide again that is, that those are the amino group at the n terminal and the carboxyl group at the c terminal so automatically no matter what pep peptide you have you already have a titrate two titratable groups but in addition which of these have residues that are titratable we look at the seven so which of these have R groups that can have a PKA? This one. This one. Alright, those two only. Alright, only those two. So, um, here I would like to mention that both cysteine and tyrosine actually have acidic functional groups. Remember, in cysteine, we have the thiol group, SH, which actually becomes S negative when charged. And for tyrosine, we have OH, all right, at the phenolic group, which when become charged becomes O negative. So, since we have here cysteine, it should have an acidic R group, all right, um, SH. And for R, which is arginine, that should have a basic group and uh, let's just simplify that by adding NH2 although we should recall that arginine has a particular guanido group that is more complicated than this NH2 but I'm just going to draw it like this for purpose of simplicity alright so based on this peptide if I'm going to be asked how many titratable groups are there I think we have already solved that question we have one two three four titratable groups only so Again, the, no, the total number of titratable groups are 2, which come from the terminals, plus all R groups in the middle, which have pKa. And again, those are these 7. Max positive charge, well, how many uh, basic functional groups do we have here? That is the answer to the question. So since we have 2 basic functional groups, given that they become positive and these ones stay neutral, so this would be neutral 0 plus 0, and if it becomes charged, plus 1 plus 1, 0, 0 plus 1 plus 1 equals positive 2. And in the other way around, the max negative charge would be, if this become neutral, 0 plus 0, and this becomes negative, negative 1 minus 1 is negative 2. So for, your cri for crying, we have 4 titratable groups. A maximum charge of positive 2 which could go all the way to negative 2 as we increase pH because remember as we increase the pH uh, as we increase the pH we continually go down in charge 